leave the campground nicer than you found it. Something my dad used to say a lot when I was growing up. The funny thing is, we didn't camp as a family, so it took me a little while to figure out what he was getting at. It's a pretty simple concept, really. Try to create a positive impact on the world around you. Yet, the ways to achieve that aren't always simple. But I will trade you an impactful idea for a few minutes of your time. Now, by implementing barter into your life, you can achieve multi-dimensional impact. And that's the idea. Impact for you, impact for your community, and impact for the planet. So trading one thing for another in the absence of cash is not a new concept. Uh, in fact, we have evidence of this going back to 6,000 BC among the ancient Egyptians. But then commerce became more complex and we developed currency. And currency allowed us to address some of the friction points of legacy barter. But here we are, 8,000 years later, and there are billions of people around the world that don't have easy access to currency or banking systems. Many of those people live in developing economies, but many of them also live in developed economies, such as immigrant populations that don't have government identification, so they don't have access to banks or credit cards. So there's a broad swath of the population that would benefit from a way to acquire goods and services without cash. But many of them are out of sight, and so they're out of mind for most of us. But then something happened in 2020 that changed the equation. The four horsemen of the apocalypse galloped across the sky, leaving a swath of death and destruction. Actually, they were on airplanes, and there were definitely more than four of them. The coronavirus pandemic hit, and that changed everything. We are living in a time of massive economic upheaval. Tens of millions of people are out of work. Entire industries like travel and movie theaters are cratering. And now we are all living in the proverbial shit. But for much of the world, they were already living in the shit and struggling. We just didn't know it. Or we didn't pay attention to it. From foreign slums to whatever town you're from. This is Dallas, Texas, where I grew up. I never saw this as a child, but it was there the whole time. But we all know people that are going through tough times. Think of the GoFundMe campaigns that you've seen. People that are having difficulty paying for a child's tuition, an emergency medical procedure, cash bail. Now, back out of that level of difficulty and think about things that we're all going through regularly. So you parents in the audience with younger kids, think about all the times you have to buy new clothes and sporting equipment for your kids, seemingly as soon as you had just purchased the last batch of stuff. Now, as the father of a 16-year-old son who's grown from a zygote to over six feet tall, I can tell you he drives me nuts. So you see we actually run the gamut here from things that are financially annoying to ruinous. But times of economic upheaval bring these problems to the surface in a very aggressive way. So, how to acquire goods and services without cash? I'll give you some simple examples. Um, I'll go hunt for food if you guard the camp. Makes sense, easy transaction, everybody wins. But what about bartering at scale? Well, Governments barter at absolutely massive scales, but we think of that as the levers of diplomacy. Businesses barter at scale. There are B2B barter exchanges around the world that are transacting billions of dollars in goods and services annually. Uh, an example might be an accounting firm trading services with a marketing firm. And the tougher times get and the more businesses want to preserve their cash, the more activity there is on these exchanges. So why not among consumers? Is it because consumers who would need to barter are people that are on the fringe of society? 
No? This might surprise you. It surprised me. In 2016, Forbes published an article that stated 63% of Americans could not absorb a $500 emergency expense without going into debt or taking money from some other more important need. Consider this. In 2016, when things were supposedly going quite well, two out of three Americans couldn't absorb a $500 hit. Car breaks down, fridge goes on the fritz, dog gets sick, and you're in debt to cover that expense. Imagine what percentage of Americans that would be today if it was 63% back then. I'm pretty sure 100% of those people would barter for goods and services if they had an efficient way to do it. Now, even with that said, we are still collecting and accumulating more goods than ever. So much so that we have celebrities like Marie Kondo and the minimalists pushing us to get rid of our crap to make our lives better. So we are basically a race of hoarders. Uh, and that leaves us with so much stuff that we're left with few choices. We can either throw it away, which is bad for our planet because we are clogging up our landfills. We can sell it on services like eBay and the like. Or we can spend more money on our stuff by getting it its own little apartment with some of its friends in the form of self-storage. In fact, 20% of Americans pay for self-storage. We have more self-storage facilities in the United States than we have McDonald's, Starbucks, and Subway locations combined. I'm no better. That's mine. Now, I will say in my defense that since the beginning of the pandemic, I've cleared out most of that stuff through donating it and bartering it for other things that I needed more. So, back to barter. It is inherently communal. Is there somebody in my community that needs this good or the service I could provide more than that good or that service sitting idle? And if there is, is there something I could get in exchange that would be of value to me? Well, perhaps not if you need to pay your car bill or your utility bill, but for so many other things in your life, the answer is a resounding yes. So why aren't we seeing consumer barter at scale? Well, it usually boils down to something known as the mutual coincidence of wants. Say, I want your apple, but you don't want my orange, so there's no trade. But what if we could connect multiple parties in a trade? That would be interesting, and it's actually already happening in some pretty unique ways. For you sports fans out there, how about multi-team trades? How many times have you seen a trade that involved multiple teams and a bunch of players and thought to yourself, how the hell did they do that? Let's look at something a little weightier than that. Organ transplants. It used to be that if I needed a kidney, and my wife, for instance, wasn't a match, I would have to go on a list to get a kidney. And I would wait on that list until one became available that was a match usually because somebody else who was a match had died. And oftentimes, my name would not go to the top of that list in time. Back in 2000, a group of economists in New England got together and developed the first multi-party organ transplant marketplace. So now, the way this happens is, if I need a kidney and my wife isn't a match, she can pledge one of her kidneys into the marketplace and then I can receive a kidney from another living donor. This radically changed how we address organ transplantation in the United States and around the world. And in fact, saves tens of thousands of people's lives a year. And it all boils down to multi-party barter dynamics. Can this work on a consumer level? Well, let's go back to me. I want your apple, but you don't want my orange. Fair enough. What if we could find somebody that wants my orange and you want a lime and they happen to have a lime? 
If we can connect these dots, then we can actually conclude this transaction successfully for all of us. And that is a multi-party trade. Now, if we do this, we sidestep the core friction point of barter, which is the mutual coincidence of wants. And then we can scale barter, and we can impact lives around the world in ways large and small. It's worth thinking that, uh, worth mentioning, that for consumer barter, unlike organ transplants or pro sports, the old phrase holds true, one person's trash is another person's treasure. So in bartering, it's not critically important that you are trading with other people at exact cash value for these goods and services. What's most important is that there are enough options in any marketplace that you can find something that you value more than the thing you're willing to give in order to get it. Also, what's known as perceived value is always in flux. The perceived value of a good or service is always in flux, uh, especially in times of economic upheaval. For instance, normally we would have thought of a lawyer's time as being more valuable than an Amazon warehouse worker's. That's in flux right now. Uh, items such as toilet paper and hand sanitizer, usually thought of as low value items, are so valuable right now during a pandemic that people are literally fighting for them in the aisles of stores. It's an extreme example, but it's real. Now, we have seen during this pandemic that consumers are trying to barter for goods and services. They are gravitating to barter. They're bartering for food, PPE, clothes, services, sourdough starter, whatever they can barter, because cash is at a premium right now. And they're using any platform available to them, whether it's Facebook groups or next door neighborhoods. There's just so much value locked up in the stuff that we have, including all that stuff in our storage units, it's a shame that we wait for times like this to actually put that stuff into motion and push it back into our communities where it's more valuable. Now, when we look to developing economies, as we discussed earlier, we see a lack of access to currency, but we also see great increases in the adoption of smartphones and internet access. And when we have tools like that in people's hands, the options to positively impact those lives are endless. Let me give you an example of how barter can help people in far-reaching ways. Uh, one of my partners at Have Need, who leads our impact operations, has 25 plus years in international development and humanitarian aid. And she is making sure that we can address use cases like this. A Nigerian goat farmer has a broken water pump. A mechanic in the next village has a son who needs shoes for school. A leather worker nearby needs more food to feed his family. And by connecting all of these people in a multi-party barter, we can radically impact the quality of their lives in one transaction. And at scale, consumer barter can then become a meaningful part of the economy. So barter can develop multidimensional impact. It's good for you. Whether you have more than you need or need more than you have, barter will allow you to acquire goods and services using only the goods and services you can provide. It's good for your community in that barter is inherently communal. It connects us. And we need that sense of connection in times like this more than ever. And barter is good for the planet because it keeps all of our crap out of the landfills and pushes it back into our communities where it can be used again, instead of buying, throwing stuff out, buying new stuff, and perpetuating the cycle. So, how to start. Could be simple as a babysitting swap with a neighbor of yours to free up a weekend night for both of you. There are online barter groups popping up all over the place. Simple internet search will point you at any number of them. And with this much barter activity on the rise, you can be sure that there are purpose-built platforms coming to market. I'm going to leave you with an audience participation challenge. Take one of these ideas, or come up with one of your own, and do a trade instead of paying cash for a good or a service. 
then estimate how much you have saved on that trade and hide that money away. Then do another and another. And after six months, figure out how much money you saved. It just might be that $500 you need for the next emergency that comes your way. Thank you. And remember, try to leave the campground nicer than you found it.